Speaking of teammates, looks like I'm, I'm, I'm about to get one here on the program, as promised. Going to talk some Carolina Panthers with the Athletics' Joe Person, who formerly covered the Gamecocks. Joe, you all ready to go over there? Looks like we can pop you right in there. I, I see you bright and clear. Do you hear me bright and clear, I guess, is the question right now. Yeah, man, you hear me? Right. Yeah, looking good over there. I appreciate you joining us this morning, man. Uh, what is going on with the Carolina Panthers these days? Wow, that is a broad question and an appropriate one. Um, they, uh, yeah, it's kind of a mess. I mean, I, the funny thing is I actually think they had a pretty good draft, Tim. Um, I like that the fact that they did not reach for a quarterback too much, certainly didn't reach for one at six, instead choosing to get, obviously, Ikem Aquanu who I thought is a terrific pickup, even the fact that he was there. Most of the mocks and the simulations I did, he was gone. Um, and they end up having their choice of tackles. Evan Neal was still there and and Charles Cross. But I, I like Aquanu. I like his makeup. Um, really neat background of, of Nigerian descent, but grew up here in Charlotte and just a, a finisher. That was I did a story on him. And that was the, the, the word Dave Doran used. Um, but this was before the draft, just best finisher he's ever been around, coached for or coached against. But, but other than that, yeah, the, 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 the draft was a good respite for Panthers fans who got to see the Rock Hill thing blow up got to see after the draft, the Panthers fired their, or, or at least have a team president who'd been on the job all of three months, leave uh, with no little or no explanation given. And so here we are. Uh, and, 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 and I guess Sam Darnold's still the quarterback, oh, by the way. Yeah, that thing. Uh, let, let's get to the quarterback next. So you got Sam Darnold, uh, who I, I was a fan in philosophically of giving him that extension before last season, right? You don't, we don't want a guy that ha- that feels like he's playing for his job every second. I, I get that. And David Tepper's got the money. Go ahead and give it to him, right? Say, hey, we're confident in you. You go do it now. Well, he didn't do it, obviously. Didn't have much of a chance with that offensive line, but it, he didn't do it, and he didn't prove to be the guy that he had already proven to be at the Jets, that, that Carolina fans had, had hoped. He would be, but then to go get Matt Corral at the end of the third round, to me, that is, that's such a lukewarm draft pick, right? It's like, eh, maybe we think he's going to be okay. So let's bring him in there. And now what? I mean, is he coming in to be the, the next guy to get a shot behind Sam Darnold? That's kind of how it feels like to me because you, you don't draft a guy in the third round and say, hey, man, you're going to be our starter game number one. But also, it's not like he's an undrafted free agent or a throwaway pick. There's still some value there. And I think for a lot of us around the SEC country, we saw Matt Corral and, and as good as he could be and really evolve as a quarterback and know that uh, I think he can play in the NFL. I think he's got the skills to. So how does it translate kind of immediately joe i guess is where i'm getting to in this long-winded brand of mine yeah i mean he's gonna get some time as you said they are not they did not draft him to rush him in and be the week one starter i, I think they feel like he's a draft and develop guy and and i really think that's how they viewed all the quarterbacks in this draft except for kenny pickett um but you know, I, as I said, I, I, I applaud them for not taking Pickett at six. I would think that would have been terrible value. And you can make the argument that even, it, you know, in the third round, it was a bit of a reach with Corral, only in what they gave up, which was next year's third to the Patriots and this year's fourth. And so, you know, if they have a bad year, that third round pick next year might be pretty high. But be that as it may, I... I was at the Liberty Pro Day to see Malik Willis in person. I liked him. I, I mean, I thought if you were going to get a draft and develop guy, he was the choice. Um, now, I think uh, Ben McAdoo had a strong voice in, in the uh, selection of Matt Corral. And he saw something in Corral that, that he thought, you know, that there was a higher upside or at least maybe the ability to be a a better rounded quarterback than Malik Willis. Um, Or the other thing is too, the cost was going to be a little high 
you know, Willis went before Corral, so they potentially would have lost a second rounder next year. But, you know, it's interesting. I, I was sort of lukewarm on Matt Corral, to, to use the phrase you, you used as well. Um, but, you know, you look at some of his tape. I mean, he out, for whatever it's worth, he outplayed Malik Willis in a head-to-head matchup. Now, obviously, Corral had more help than Willis. But, but back to Darnold. Um, and, and then I'll stop my long-winded diatribe. Um, I am interested to see what he looks like behind a grown-up actual offensive line compared to what he was playing behind most of last year. And I think a healthy Christian McCaffrey makes a lot of quarterbacks, including Sam Darnold, look better. No doubt about it. Are you convinced that that's what this offensive line is going to be, Joe, that it, it is going to be different? Feels like it. I mean, I... They, uh, I, I give Fitter the GM credit. I mean, they, they came out and that was their stated goal. They were going to improve the O line. Started in free agency with a couple of interior linemen in Bradley Bozeman and uh, Austin Corbett. Uh, Corbett from the Rams, Bozeman from the Ravens, two proven franchises in this league, and uh, and so and then and then getting a Quanu will allow that allows them to do is. They picked a, a last year in the third round. They took a BYU All American guy, Brady Christensen, who's sort of a tackle guard tweener. Doesn't have real long arms, but very good athlete. I mean, he was a good player for BYU. Now Aquanu comes in. They can bump Christensen to left guard. They've already paid Taylor Moten on the other side of the line. I mentioned Co- uh, Bozeman and Corbett. I think you got something there. I mean, it's, like I say that, and then some guys who started last year and struggled, and and guys who started in the league, and one of them, uh, one of them, Cam Irving's a former first round pick. Now he becomes a backup. Michael Jordan, appropriately named for playing in Charlotte, becomes a backup. And now I think your depth is better. So I like what they did along the offensive line, but as you know, in this league, it all comes back to how the quarterback plays. Yeah, no doubt about it. And what are your impressions having seen Sam Darnold up close and personal and the the future of that position, I guess, now? Well, I don't think Sam's the future. I, I mean, I think even at his best, I think he's, you know, maybe a guy that gets you to the playoffs. Maybe. Um, he he did look good at the beginning of last season. I mean, this, this team, a lot of people, a lot of us forget, they started 3-0. and now the schedule was was pretty weak uh, early on, and then Christian McCaffrey gets hurt in that week three. It was a short week at Houston Thursday night. He'd had a bunch of carries and touches the first two weeks. It was funny they had really been careful up in Spartanburg, and uh, down in Spartanburg, and uh, and also uh, he didn't play a preseason game, and so you're like, hey, I think they're kind of finally figuring it out. Uh, after his lost season of 2020, but then they kind of went from zero to 60 with him. And he had like 28 touches in week one. I think he averaged 28 in week one and week two, which is fine, except you're playing Thursday night in week three. He gets hurt. And then Darnold, who I said, looked pretty good those first couple few games. Then he didn't look so good. And he got antsy in the pocket. He was rushing through his reads which was affecting the timing of of the the patterns and the routes led to some interceptions and it was just ugly football and then he got hurt then he got hurt and cam and and all that i will say this week 18 at tampa fairly unforgettable or excuse me forgettable game for the panthers they lose to the the playoff bound bucks but Darnold came out in that game behind that same crummy offensive line we were talking about, and his he was back to kind of going through the reads and progressions quickly and getting rid of the ball on time. He did have a pick late in the game, but I think it was really it was on Robbie Anderson stopped his route short, and I think that game uh, and I, it's one week sample I know, but I but I do know that Matt Rule and Scott Fitter, especially Rule. You know, I think it kind of like gave them pause. I mean, listen, it didn't give them pause enough that they still didn't go try to get Deshaun Watson. I mean, like, let's not kid ourselves. But 
I think there's at least some glimmer of hope there. He's Joe Person, former beat reporter for the state newspaper and the Gamecocks, and we'll get to that in a little bit, Joe, but I've uh, been covering the Carolina Panthers for a long time, doing it for the Athletic. Now, are you joining us from your breakfast nook, by the way? Love a good <laughs> breakfast nook. Yeah, I am, and I really ought to turn the camera around because I we, we're in South Charlotte. I know you're familiar with this area. I mean, we get deer in the backyard. I've got a little bluebird nest going. Um, it's kind of like a, just a little... It's just a little lair here away from the city. Uh, my grass doesn't grow real well because I got a bunch of trees, but I do like the wildlife here in South Charlotte. Nice. I think a couple, maybe a bird or two is trying to get in on your interview here. I think I might be hurting that that, that chirp in there. Uh, you mentioned a I'm mess. Just, just going to take this right off. Oh, thank you. This is what we're, we do, right? We're just going to take we're going to take the the, the unrestricted listener, the viewer right out. Beautiful. Into the, into this backyard there, but go on. I, I Very don't... nice. If, if you guys are just listening to it right now, now we can see the backdrop. Is that, wait a second, is that a badminton net I'm seeing too? Is that what we got oh, going? That's, my kid's, that's my kid's baseball net. Oh, okay. Nice. All right. Are you a top, hit the top half of the ball or you uh, get the backspin and get under the ball, Joe? Where are we going with the kid? I'm kind of top half, but he okay. is all left-handed uppercut dude, launch angle, and i it's a losing battle. I've tried to to fight that, and it's not happening. Embrace it, man. Uh, I had a buddy who played in the Red Sox organization, and he said that they had the roving instructors. Ted Williams hit the bottom half of the ball. Carl Yastrzemski hit the top half of the ball. You can't win, man. You can do it any any way. Just just let the kid go, man. Let let him rip. That's what I say. Uh, you mentioned that the the Panthers were a bit of a mess there, the quarterback position, um, and overall. With this Rock Hill situation and David, David Tepper, what, what's the deal there, man? Where, where is, where's the, I guess, the identity of the Carolina Panthers right now with Tepper in, in ownership? Yeah, I mean, listen, it's it's ugly down there. I mean, you've probably driven past it. You've got like this hawking half, not half, but partially constructed steel headquarters coming out of the red dirt in Rock Hill. There's the the exit ramp. Work does continue on that because that's a state funded project, but one that probably wasn't going to. I think they were going to develop that exit eventually, but it got it got expedited, as you know, because of the Panthers. I mean, I do think there's there's blame to go around. I I had somebody a lot smarter than I am in these business matters tell me that where the Panthers aired was trying to uh, get these bonds and this 225 million in bonds for the infrastructure through Rock Hill instead of through York County, because Rock Hill does not have necessarily the, the, the tax base that York County does with Fort Mill, other unincorporated areas of York County. And I think they just, and, and I know York County was a part of this too, but I think they should have been a bigger part based on what I was told, but I don't, you know, and so, okay, the 225, which is not insignificant, I get it, but when you're a owner worth $17 billion, I think you don't, I, I think you owe it to your fan base to, to not just at the first sign of trouble, take your ball and go home. I think, I think goodwill, uh, I don't think Jerry Richardson would have done that. Um, you know, and, and he had his own stuff. I know I'm not, it's apples and oranges, but I don't know. There, there's, there's plenty of blame to go around, go around. And I do think Rock Hill was negligent on those, on those infrastructure bonds. But again, I, I think Tepper should have, and I, you know, they said they should have pulled out earlier. Uh, and maybe that's true too, but it just, the timing of it, it's just, it's ugly and just, I mean, it is an eyesore, you know, physical uh, eyesore down there right along I-77 for all the world to see. Is it too, is it going too far? Is it too easy for us from the outside looking in to say, hey, that is a physical manifestation of what actually is going on within the organization with Matt Rule. You got Fitterer coming in. You got Rule, I think, who is is really on the hot seat from a fan perspective for sure. You got Tepper with a win now attitude that he's not getting wins. Uh, is that just too easy? That's that's got to be too easy, doesn't it? Surely it can't be that clear right in front of our eyes. 
I mean, there there is an argument to be made that some of these issues are not a coaching problem or a front office problem, but an ownership problem. Um, yeah, clearly David Tepper's a bright guy. He did have some football background as a minority partner with the Steelers before buying the Panthers, but he's not a guy that grew up around the game. Like, again, not to keep harkening back, but Jerry Richardson played football at the highest levels. I mean, not collegiately at Wofford, but certainly in the NFL, winning a, a, a championship uh, with the Baltimore Colts uh, in the late 50s. So, I mean, he was around the game. Tepper, I think a lot of this, he's he was learning on the fly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it all, everything gets magnified, as you know, when you're not winning. And and uh, things that might be like, yeah, you know, it, it all looks ugly. Uh, you know, as I said, they I do think the, the fans seem to and, and most of the national guys seem to like this draft class. Um, basically, mainly because of Aquanu. But they did some things late, too, where they took some guys with some, rather than worry about college production, they took some guys like the Barno edge rusher for Virginia Tech. I liked him. Might not turn out, but at least it was kind of a guy with with traits and tools. But, um, yeah, man, it's, I don't know. Like, and you, just, you just wonder what the next shoe to drop is going to be here. Yeah. Uh, but but it, the schedule release will be interesting too this week. Like there's never a slow moment in the NFL, and and there's not uh, because you might want to keep an eye on like when the bye week is for the Panthers because they have some now they have some former NFL head coaches on this staff, and so if Dave Tepper finally has seen enough of Matt Rule and the buys in week six or seven or whatever it is. You know, you can turn to Steve Wilkes. You can turn to Ben McAdoo uh, and just say, hey, <laughs> take it to the house, boys. Uh, we're, we're going a different direction. Yeah, your direction today on The Athletic was with the undrafted free agents and the, and the guys who will be uh, getting a shot now. Charleston Rambo kind of stood out to me on that list, especially with all the wide receivers. Uh, is that how you see it, too? Yeah, he went from uh, not a lot of production to a whole bunch of it. Uh, his, you know, of course, that, that last year at Miami, I'm trying to think if he was a transfer guy or so many. Yeah, Oklahoma. That's right. Thank you. Um, so Beamer had background with Rambo. But, yeah, I mean, Miami's had its fair share of, of pretty good receivers. And in one year, he took took care of ownership of all the single season receiving records. So, I'm not convinced their receiving core right here as it stands. It feels I like DJ Moore a lot. Um, he's had three consecutive 1,100-yard seasons. But Robbie Anderson, he was a, kind of a no-show last year after getting paid. I mean, Terrace Marshall from, from LSU, who they took in the second round last year, he was kind of a no-show. And so they didn't have a whole lot of weapons. And so – I, and then they didn't draft one. I, I know they only had six picks. And so one of those, and they, it's very clear they expect one of those undrafted guys, I think, to stick because they signed five of them. And as you said, Rambo, uh, Rambo kind of jumps off the page. Sure, special teams will play into that and the whole thing, and it's tough to, I think, uh, project how a guy that, that's not used to playing special teams or maybe doesn't specialize it in college will do in the NFL, so we'll see when it comes to that. You mentioned uh, Shane Beamer there and the, the connection with Oklahoma and the whole deal. Joe, how long did you cover the Gamecocks back in the day? I covered from 02 to through the 09 season. I think I left right – yeah, I did. I left in August of 10. So it was an interesting time. I caught the tail end of the Holtz era. I think that was three years or so. And then the start of the Spurrier era, which was which was a lot of fun. <laughs> and and he, I remember him beating Florida in Columbia for the first time. And, and just, it was cool. I mean, I've, 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 we have a bunch of friends still in Columbia. My daughter, my younger daughter, just... Uh, so we just sent in the payment for her to be a Gamecock in the fall. So looking forward to getting down there and I, I see your backdrop, man. I, I want to, 
I don't know if I'm going to go for the Georgia game because I know how nuts that always is, but I need to find a game or two to come down in the fall. How does covering the Carolina Panthers compare to covering the, the South Carolina Gamecocks? So it's different. I mean, I I miss some of those college towns and, and the pregame, you know, the Vol Walk and – um, the Grove and I mean, I mean, the, the Cockabooses in 2001, like you don't really have that in the NFL, except maybe Lambeau uh, and Buffalo, Buffalo and, and Green Bay. And I think the reason I like those is they sort of most resemble a college feel, you know, prior to the game and this, the neighborhoods around the field. Um, and then in terms of, so I, I do miss like the, the, the pageantry of college football. I like, uh, in terms of access and stuff, I like the NFL. I know it was weird during COVID, as you know, but the college kids are so often, depending on, I mean, pretty much across the board, are kind of under the thumb of of the coaching staff and, by extension, the SID office. It's just the nature of the game. I get it. Here, uh, covering the NFL, these guys have a stake. You know, like if they're not getting playing time, they want to let the world know about it through the media sometimes or through their own channels now. And it is interesting, too. We have seen this. It's been fascinating to watch this empowerment of the quarterbacks, especially, but also the wide receivers this past off season. Not unlike, I mean, basically following the NBA LeBron James type lead and uh it's 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 a wonder it took so long quite frankly for these the quarterbacks who control everything to say you know what i'm not loving seattle anymore and i'm russell wilson and you're gonna trade me and or things are just gonna be pretty miserable so uh it it, it's cool i i i I like covering both is kind of i mean i'm I wouldn't mind somewhere down the road having some a position where I could kind of get back to doing college and pros as, as kind of a combination. Sounds like a, an, an ideal situation for sure. When you can do, if you can dip into both, um, wondering to get you out on today and really appreciate your time, man. Uh, is there anything specifically you mentioned Spurrier beating Florida for the first time they played in Williams Bryce. Is, is there any other specific memory that you have that stands out in your time of covering the Gamecocks, what you might have seen with the, the players and coaches? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I I'm still in touch with some of the athletes I covered. Like Travell Wharton was a senior, uh junior senior. It was his last year with the Gamecocks, my first year on the beat. And then, of course, I've covered him as a player with the Panthers and then also as a uh, as a coach. He's now, of course, with Ron Rivera at the Commanders. But um, my 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 yellow lab's trying to come join the party out here. I'll bring him in. Bring him in. Uh, No, because then he's going to lick me. He's not a he's he's not a biter. He's a liquor dog. Uh, where was I going with this? Oh, Captain Marlin. I love this story. Captain Marlin. And again, I, I sort of remember the people more than the actual games. And there were great games too, but I have a terrible memory for that. Even like Panthers games from not that long ago, some will say, remember that was the game that uh, Cam hit uh, Brenton Burson. And, and I was like, I have no memory. Of that. <laughs> but I remember Brenton Burson, a Wofford guy, shout out. Um, but Captain Marlin. So Marlin comes to, to South Carolina and he is um, uh, just a delight to cover. Like, I mean, he was one of those guys I was talking about the college access and stuff. He didn't care. <laughs> Captain was going to speak his mind, but he had braces. I mean, he was a young kid out of Mobile, Alabama. And um, he had like the, the bands were garnet and black. I'll never forget that. And then I come here and he's a member of the Panthers and still to this day, one of my favorite people to have covered uh, for his honesty, his accessibility, and just, just a good dude. Um, I'm a coaches. I, I knew Be- Shane Beamer and I, 
he was a GA at Georgia Tech when I was covering Georgia Tech. Then I, you know, our, our paths crossed in Columbia. I thought it was super when they hired Shane Beamer and the success he had last year. So uh, it's cool, man. I, I like Columbia. Cost of living was a heck of a lot better than Charlotte. I'll say that too, buddy. And the, and the traffic, right? And the traffic. It's except for the trains, except Assembly Street trains. No doubt about it, man. Uh, so is Shane Beamer going to win big at South Carolina? I hope so. It's a hard job, man. I don't, I don't need to tell you. It was, it was hard before Dabo turned Clemson into the behemoth that it is. Uh, but what a great start last year. I mean, I, I mean, they, they, what was the bowl game against Tar Heels? I mean, they kind of beat them up and down that day. Uh, but um, yeah, it's cool. Like I said, like my, one of the reasons my daughter, I want, my oldest is at Wofford actually. And the younger girl was between Wofford and South Carolina. And two, I think two things drove her decision. One, three things. I can't add. Uh, she, she was born in Columbia. So she, you know, had childhood memories there. Then she likes football. Like she kind of liked the idea of going to SEC school. And then she's in the Darla Moore business school. Shout out. Shout out Darla Moore. Nice work, man. So you're doing it right there. You've got uh, two daughters in college or at least on their way. Right. And you got the sun hitting the bottom of the ball with some backspin there with the net. And you got the, the wildlife preserve with the dog taking care of things. Nice work, Jeff. Nice work. I appreciate it, man. The only thing I don't have is the noontime Columbia basketball game where you would just dominate. And, uh, oftentimes upset Travis Haney. In- <laughs> Those were great games back in the day. Uh, that's when you would run circles around us with your uh, triathlon training. I think back in the day, man. I would just run. I just I, you guys were playing basketball. I was always. I was just like sort of running on the side, getting getting my steps in. That now I'm old man. Now I get my steps in in my hocus. Good for you. Same here, man. Absolutely. And appreciate your time. Great catching up with you, Joe. Would love to do it again sometime. Always, man. Great to see you, Tim. And uh, holler at me anytime. Will do. Joe Person, ladies and gentlemen, will 